And I just encourage you to join us and fellowship with us. Uh, it just, we, it could not be a more wonderful place. So thank you so much for having me. Um, Charlie, go ahead and start the meditation. Sure. call to worship this morning is from Psalms 92, 1 and 2. It says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we are just so thankful for who you are, for your faithfulness, for your love. Father, I just uh, I pray that you'd be with us this morning, Lord, as we worship you, Lord. We want to lift up our, our voices in praise. We want to hear from your word. I pray that you'd fill me with your Holy Spirit, that I wouldn't say anything that's wrong. Pray that you would help me and be with me, Lord. I pray that you'd give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that understands, Lord, what your will is, Lord, how we can conduct our affairs how we can live our lives for you, Lord. And we ask this in your holy name. Amen. <clears throat> Hymn 251, On a Hill Far Away.
At this time, we're going to enter into a, a time of confession. Um, I'm going to read a passage of scripture, and then we'll just take a little moment to spend some time with the Lord confessing any sins that are in your life and, and just uh, finding forgiveness in that. First uh, John 2 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Today our scripture reading is from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, hymn number 28, Great is Thy Faithfulness, you may stand. Yeah. 
At this time, we're going to do the offertory. Um, as you know, we, uh, we don't pass the plate during this time, but there's a plate in the back. Um, and the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Um, we miss out on God's blessing when we don't give to, to his kingdom and support his work. Um, tithing is, an, is actually an act of worship, and I don't want to miss out on God's blessing and an opportunity to worship. So I just encourage all of us um, to give out of, of God's abundance. stand. I have any prayer requests at this time? This Sue. Our Father, who's in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Someday I will get used to the order. Go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. That's how 
No. But that kind of evangelism, as Jacob is, is, is kind of is an evangelist himself in a sense. But we're all called to be that. We really are. And even when I was talking this morning, we were coming over listening to uh, to Keith Green, that he was somebody that uh, that was in the seventies, a great musician, but a super evangelist. And evangelism during that time, in the revival of the seventies and eighties was not necessarily in the churches. It was from mouth to mouth. It was people sharing it with somebody else. And I just pray that that, and I know that's what, what you, you feel in your heart too. It, it, it really must be that. We come to church to get disciples and to worship and fellowship, but it's also, it's that word of mouth. And I pray that spirit of the Lord would fall upon us all that fell upon St. Patrick, of which you all are saints. <laughs> he wasn't the only saint, but uh, but you know we might just pray that that spirit uh, of the Lord to make us bold again, you know, uh, to, to 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 that spirit that because I, I I'll say I'm one I I'm Luke, I've gotten lukewarm when it comes to telling people about Jesus. I'm bold behind that pulpit, but on the streets it's a different story, you know. But uh, but you know. Said, I, 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 I'm not going to take it. No, that's it. I read that I could become a citizen of Ireland, a dual citizen. If your mother or grandmother came from Ireland, you could be, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that reminds me too, just what Pastor Joe preached a few weeks ago that really hit us. It's just like, pray for one person. Pray for one person. Ask the Lord who it is. Pray about that first. And who is that one person? And really start praying for them. And, uh, and, and let's see what the Lord does. And then try to reach them for the Lord. And you said, hey, let's pray about that. Let's just pray about that right now. And then we'll, we'll get started. So, Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you'd lead, lay one person on each and every person's heart here, Lord. One person, Lord, for, that, that we can reach for the gospel. You're the one who changed hearts and minds. You're the one that can open up the eyes of the blind. Lord, who are you going to work in? Who do you want to use us to reach for the gospel? Lord, we ask for boldness. Lord, it's, it can be especially scary with family sometimes, Lord, to try to, to try to visit with a person that we haven't visited with, Lord. And um, we ask for your help. We ask for an opportunity for the word. Lord, I, I pray that you'd show us favor in that person's sight and that they could hear and receive the gospel, Lord. And I pray that we'd never give up, Lord, that you never gave up on us. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Appreciate that. Our passage of scripture today is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I think I titled it Rejoice, Pray, and Give Thanks. It's because I chickened out. I was, I was going to title it, I guarantee you this is God's will for your life. But I was afraid I'd look out like thinking I was smart and, and Dr. Ingalls would be like, <laughs> something like that. So I backed off. I backed off a little bit. So I'm just going with Rejoice, Pray, and Give Thanks this morning. So it's God's will for your life. <laughs> well, uh, well, I've got I've got several preachers here, so you know, it's, uh, yeah, no, no, these gentlemen are so gracious to me. That's why I can joke about it. If it was bad, I wouldn't even joke about it. So they're very good to me. Um, years ago, I was teaching a young adult uh, Bible uh, Sunday school class, and we had a young lady that was visiting. And she is from the University of, uh, no, she's from Texas A&M, and she's working for a big plant. It was a temporary plant. We had the wind farms coming in. And uh, she'd taken this inter internship, and she was in Woodward, and she visited our Sunday school class, and she asked, she's like, man, how can I know God's will for my life? She told a story about her friend who hadn't taken an internship that she was kind of holding out and waiting, and she wanted to know how she could know God's will for her, her life. Have, have you ever been in a situation like that? Have there been times you're like, what is God's will for my life? 
Well, what is God's will for this season in my life? Like maybe, you know, she's, she's entering into her career. Some people's careers are over. What, what does God have me, for me in this life? Because we're all still here, right? So God does have a will for our life. Um, you know, have you ever wondered, am I wasting my life? Uh, there's a book that I read probably 15 years ago, and the, the name of the book was Don't Waste Your Life. And in it, the, uh, the guy's name is John Piper, and he said, don't spend your life looking for seashells. And the Bible even warns us, it says in Ephesians 5, 12 through 17, Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So it's an important question, isn't it? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I believe that this passage suggests three specific postures that God wants us to demonstrate in our lives. And they're so important that the writer says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The Bible doesn't say that very often, does it? There's only a few places that I can think of where God specifically says, this is my will. One of them is in, in Matthew 7, 21. We learned in Matthew 17, 21. 21 straight from Jesus's lips um, he says that only those who do God's will will enter into the kingdom of heaven so when God says this is my will for you I'm all ears I'm going to pay attention what what God has to say to me so let me let me repeat my main idea this passage suggests three specific postures God wants us to demonstrate in our lives now why do I use the word posture a posture is a conscious, mental, or outward behavioral attitude. A conscious, mental, or outward behavioral attitude. This is not like a specific one-time thing that we can do and check off our list. Man, I did those three things. I did God's will. I'm good. This, this is talking about how we can carry ourselves, how we can conduct our, ourselves, how, how we can live out our lives. That's why I'm using the word posture for here. So first, we can do God's will by being a people who rejoice always. According to Strong's Concordance, rejoice means, it says rejoice is to properly delight in God's grace. Literally, to experience God's grace or favor. To be conscious, glad for His grace. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. I want you to notice that the writer didn't wrap himself. The writer did not clothe himself. Jacob Thompson did not bring about his own salvation. The Lord did it. The Lord has imputed his righteousness into my account. And so that's one thing that I can really rejoice for in my life. So when Paul writes, rejoice always, he is instructing us to always be mindful of God's grace, to, to experience God's grace continually and, and keep that grace on the forefront of our mind. That is what Paul's talking about when he says, rejoice always. So now let's talk a little bit about what it's not, what he doesn't mean by this. The Bible does not expressly forbid us from being sad, does it? The Bible does not expressly say, never be angry. Remember in Romans 12, 15, Paul said, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those that weep. We do that with each other sometimes, don't we? If we're good brothers and sisters. What about be angry and yet do not sin? There's a thing called righteous anger. It's one of those things that I personally am scared of because I only really trust the Lord Jesus to be righteously angry. It seems like when I'm, I'm angry, it's usually for selfish reasons. But the Lord has built us with emotion. So that's not exactly what the passages of Scripture is getting at with here. God built us with emotions. Things will go wrong. There's going to be a, a situations where it's appropriate to be sad. It's going to be appropriate to cry with each other. Do you remember when Jesus wept? When uh, Lazar at Lazarus' death, Jesus, when he in Luke nineteen forty one, when Jesus was approaching Israel, 
Uh, it says, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. I read a story this week, and it's, uh, it's probably a story most of you know, but it just fits so well. There was a, a lawyer in Chicago. His name was Horatio Spafford. He was, he was a very wealthy Chicago lawyer. He was also a great Christian man. In 1870, he lost his son to scarlet fever. A year later, the Chicago fires wiped out most of his real estate assets. A few years later after that, he was planning to take a trip to, to Europe to, to attend a revival with, with that D.L. Moody was putting on. And, and he was going to go with his family, his wife and his four daughters, and he got delayed. A business, some sort of business deal delayed him. So his wife and daughters, they, they go on ahead of him. He's going to meet up with them. Halfway across the Atlantic, his bo their boat was struck. And the boat sank. And when he got the telegram from his wife, there's two words that said, saved alone. And so while he was crossing the Atlantic to join his wife, Anna, he wrote these words. I think you'll recognize them. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. When I read these lines, I can't think, help but think of when Paul wrote, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. I'm not always going to have my health. You know, I'm not always going to have Carly, and Carly's not always going to have me, right? Bad things are going to happen in my life. You know, right now I rejoice over my children in this church church that they've that they've come to the Lord but there could come, become a time where, where one of them walks away from the Lord right there could be time that I have a child that gets hooked on drugs life is hard but I'm saved I'm redeemed but here's the deal it's even more than that with the Bible the good news is even more than that the Bible tells us that Jesus came to bring good news to the afflicted Jesus came to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty, excuse me, to the captives and set the prisoners free. And Jesus has invited you and he's invited me to join him in that work. I'm an ambassador for Christ. You are an ambassador for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ who gave us this ministry of reconciliation. I carry around within me the ministry of reconciliation. You carry around within you the ministry of reconciliation. We have brothers and sisters here that have kids and grandkids that are struggling, that have walked away from the Lord. We have a family here that is looking at the very real poss possibility of losing a son-in-law, and they, they are trying to bring him back from that. And they are ministering to a daughter that's almost in constant grief because they carry around within them the ministry of reconciliation. We're all law minister to the lost and brokenhearted, we have the good news of the gospel. I mean, the gospel is good news to those that God's preparing. Even in our own suffering, God can use us to, to set the captives free. Think about the number of people that have been comforted by Horatio Spafford's song, It Is Well With My Soul. Now, I would never change, change places with him. He has impacted so many people. That's not what I want for my life. That's not what you want for your life. But God is, has changed, taken a bad situation and he's used it for good. We are all ambassadors for the good news. We're all light bearers. And I'm very grateful for that. I can rejoice in that even with any kind of suffering. The second thing we can do, we can uh, 
The second is that we can do God's will through unceasing prayer. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. I'm talking about involving the Lord in every aspect of your day. When you get up in the morning, worship, pray, seek the Lord. When you go to bed, worship, pray, seek the Lord. But don't skip the middle of the day. Around 2015, the Lord really began to work in my life. I really began growing in the Lord, and I was getting up in the morning. I was worshiping. I was going to work. I can think of one morning where I was just particularly on fire. I had a coworker. We were driving out to a location. I was witnessing. I gave him my testimony, gave him the gospel. I was just praising the Lord on my fire. We're doing, we're doing this job together. And um, I was looking for a piece of equipment that I thought I, my company desperately needed. A piece of equipment had gone down that tooled up the soil and pads. And I thought I was really handicapped at the time not having this piece of equipment. And I'd ordered this from the, the Arnett New Holland dealer. It's going to be like five grand. He told me to take two weeks. We're a month in. I find a used one for like two grand in Kansas. I call him up. I'm like, hey, cancel that. I've got a piece of equipment. He goes, oh, Hey, can I call you right back? I was like, okay. So he calls me back and he goes, hey, that piece of equipment sitting out in my yard. And I lost it. I mean, I just let him have it. I was like, I've been desperate for this piece of equipment. And it's sitting in your yard. And you know, politely, a lot of times when we confront somebody, we leave them a little wiggle room. We'll, we'll let them have a little bit of that. And then we'll kind of go on. Every excuse he had, man, I just torpedoed that thing. The next one came, I just shot that thing down. I just left him no room for escape. It's because I had not learned to walk with the Lord throughout the day. I didn't know if this guy knew the Lord. I knew him. He'd sold me my equipment. You want to make matters worse? I had to go home and tell my wife, guess what I did today? And he lives two houses down. You know what I mean? So... But the worst of it is, I didn't know this guy's a Christian. As a matter of fact, I doubt he was. And I ended up having to apologize profusely for on the thing when I wasn't really wrong, but I was wrong. But it's because I hadn't learned to pray without ceasing. You know what I mean? I was starting my day that way, and I was finishing my day that way, but I was not walking with the Lord, you know, continually. Anyway, so I might get too story heavy. I apologize. But while I was reading this, I, I read about George Mueller. And this really helped me. He'd pray. He, he started at an orphanage in Bristol, England. Um, he prayed for his, to get uh, orphans. He prayed for a building. He'd pray for food. Um, and one of the things that struck me is he would pray for little things. When somebody made him late, instead of getting mad because I would be mad about that, he would pray, hey, Lord, hurry those people along. When he needed a boiler fixed because winter was coming along, he was like, Lord, give these men a mind to work. And guess what? They worked all throughout the night and they fi fixed his boiler and I realized hey I can do that like instead of getting mad at Jimmy I'd be like Lord give give Jimmy a mind to work instead of being mad that somebody's holding me up I can take all these things to the Lord and I encourage you to take the Lord with you man when you get up in the morning pray when you have an important phone call like man, I've got to I've got to comfort an old friend. Lord, give me, the, give me the words. When I go to meet a student for breakfast, I don't want to go with nothing to share. I want to call upon the name of the Lord and be like, hey, Lord, be with me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I have something to, to offer this person. Because who are we praying to? We are praying to the creator and the sustainer of the universe, the savior of the whole world, the one who has the, the power to heal you, the one that has the power to heal me, the one that has the power to open up the, the eyes of the blind. I can do none of these things, but Jesus can do all of them. And we, we want to pray without ever giving up. Do we call upon the name of the earth? Jesus once asked a question uh, and the context was on prayer. And he said, will I find faith on earth? Jesus can do more, far more abundantly than we can ask or think. We don't have to stew over things. We don't have to live in constant anxiety. We don't have to walk alone like the, like the hymn says. We can take all our requests to a God who loves us and gave himself for us. 
We can, point three, we can do God's will by giving thanks no matter the circumstances. These are hard things, right? Colossians 3, 15 through 17 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart and be thankful. Let the words of Christ richly dwell within you and singing with thankfulness. Whatever you do, give thanks. Giving thanks to God is a good indicator of our spiritual condition. When I have Christ's peace in my heart, I'm thankful. When I'm filling myself with God's word, I'm more naturally thankful. When I'm involving God in my words and deeds, I'm aware of his help, and I'm thankful. Psalms 107 and 8 and 9 says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, for his wonders to the sons of men, for he has satisfied my thirsty soul, and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. All right, one more kind of long illustration. Sorry. I'm going to tell you everything I know in this one <laughs> sermon. So, and then... Have you ever heard of The Hiding Place? Has anybody read that book? Okay, good. You have to read this book. It, will, it changed my life. It is like a family favorite. It's not just my favorite. My wife loves this book. Well, and it, it tells of the Timbu family. They lived in Harlem, Harlem. They were Christians. Um, they were the, the, the old man, Corey, uh, old man Tim Boom. He's, he, he was, uh, I think he was in his 80s. Uh, Corey and Betsy were in their 50s. They were Christians, and basically what happened is Germany came in, and the Jewish people started having to run, and they were hiding Jewish people in their home. And I'm not giving anything away. You know it's going to happen. It's part of the book. It's really charming, but you're like, oh, I know what's coming. They got caught. And so, long story short, Corey and Betsy end up in Ravensbrück. It, it, it was a concentration camp, and they get there first before the women get released from their work duties, and they get put in this, in this barracks, and it's disgusting. As soon as they walk in there, like, the smell is awful, and they realize they're just covered in free, fleas as they go to their barracks, and they have to climb over several pallets to get to their area. And um, I actually look back to refresh my memory on the story, and uh, I was going to use it anyway, but uh, Betsy says to Corey, she says, uh, hey, remember what we read this morning. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. So, Corey, what can we be thankful for? She's like, Corey's like, Betsy's like, hey, we're here together. We have this Bible. They didn't search us. We've got this Bible, and we're going to have all these women that we can minister to and the fleas, you know. And Corey's like, I am not giving thanks for the fleece. I'm not doing that. It's like, excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not doing that. Well, I'm not going to give anything away. But later on, they get separated in their work detail and Corey comes back to the barracks and, and Betsy's got a smile on her face like, and, and Corey says, well, you seem pretty satisfied with yourself. What's going on? She said, today we had a misunderstanding and we were, we asked the supervisor what size socks we're supposed to be ma making. And we asked them to come in and we heard the supervisor say, I'm not going in there to the guards and the guards wouldn't go in there because of the fleas. This barracks had started out with a bunch of women. You, they're starving to death. They're cold. They're scared. Fights would break out there. So that's how that started out. But through their, their, their Bible study times, it turned into, hey, excuse me, hey, sorry, no harm done. They changed that barracks. And they were allowed to have these Bible studies because the guards wouldn't come in. And it was those fleas that were keeping them in. So, I mean, that, that, is, that is a tough, tough thing to be thankful. But God, the Lord turns bad situations for good. But I want to point out one thing in the passage. This may be, I hope I'm not on, on thin ice after telling that story, but the, but the passage does say, be thankful in everything, right? It's not exactly for everything. I, I don't think we need to be thankful for Hitler, evil, 
Satan, sin, the lost world. But I think we can be thankful in our circumstances, like, like that we are written in the book of life. Uh, Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work for the good, work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. That is a rock-solid promise from God that we can count on. God knows you. He loves you. He knows your circumstances. And He will eventually use all of them for your good because God is sovereign over all circumstances. So how did I answer the intern's question from Texas A&M? Like, how do I know God's will for my life? I told her that, hey, off the top of my head, there's only two specific places that I can think of where the, the Bible says, this is your will for your life. One of them is earlier in 1 Thessalonians, it's 4.3. It says, for this is God's will, your sanctification, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality and rejoice always, Pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is God's will for your life in Christ Jesus. I believe with all my heart that if you're rejoicing in the Lord's salvation, that you're rejoicing that you're an ambassador for Christ, that you're calling upon the name of the Lord, that you're involving him in your daily affairs, you're praying and laying out all your burdens upon the Lord and that you're giving him your gratitude and your thanks and your circumstances that God will surely get you where he wants you to go. He's not going to fail you. If you're really pursuing him like that, God is going to get you where you want to go. And will we trust God with our lives? Will we invite him in? We can. We can trust him with our eternal security. We can, we can trust him with the daily affairs of our lives. And God will surely do the rest. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are just thankful for you and what you've done. I'm so thankful, Lord, that I can pay, put my faith and trust in a faithful God that never changes, that loves me, that loves my family, that looks out for me. And though we might suffer in this life, Lord, we will be redeemed. We will be with you in heaven forever, Lord. I pray that you'd use us to be ministers of the gospel, to comfort our friends and our family and the lost, Lord. I pray that you would uh, use this while we're here, Lord. I ask this in your holy name. Amen. Hymn number 330, When Peace Like a River Attendeth. You may stand. It is. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Um, Sue, go ahead, go ahead, Alan. Don't we have some other events, Grace, coming up too? Yeah. 